The Magnificent Battle, Merlin, Arthur's Court, and the Mistress of Time, by The Magus, read by The Magus. Chapter 21, The Dungeon. It took about an hour and a half of difficult walking, hands tied painfully in front of them, with straps of leather or hide of some kind, for the boys to come upon a broad field. Across that field, and beside a slowly moving river, was every young boy's dream, a castle with flags flying, crenellated battlements, towers, sentries, a moat, drawbridge, and portcullis. Wow, Fergus said, that is a beautiful castle. Damon was not in a mood for the appreciation of architectural beauty. His wrists hurt from where they were tied, his feet hurt from marching through the woods, and he even thought his neck hurt already from the thought of being hanged on King Arthur's gallows. I don't think we are going to have the pleasure of living in one of those upstairs apartments, he complained. From what these guys said, we're going to spend our time in the basement, or at least as much time as we have, before we get hanged for Mikkel's act of compassion in saving that big white deer. Mikkel was somewhat defensive about this. After all, it was he who had pointed in the wrong direction to save the white stag. There was something really special about that deer, he responded. Besides, you heard what that talking dog, Seer, said. He said that the animals would take care of us. Oh, yeah? Damon's bad mood was turning to anger. Well, let's see them save us now. I'm ready now. What was that word, Yahoo and when? No, Fergus shot back. Oh, when? Well, whatever you said, where are they? Why aren't they coming? What is the matter with all these so-called animal rescuers? I'm ready to be rescued now. Maybe it takes a little time, Fergus responded in a reasonable tone. Maybe they have to choose their time. It wouldn't seem to make sense to do something now while we are with all these men and dogs. Just be patient. Patient? Patient? Forget patience. Everything I have hurts. And not only that, I'm getting hungry. I'm tired of being patient. I want action now, Damon nearly yelled. The only response was a prod in the back by one of the captors. Yeed ye to the castle, he said in a surly tone. Damon plodded along, across the field, across the drawbridge, under the portcullis. When they got inside, the bailey was awash with activity. There were men on the walls keeping watch. There was a delicious smell of something cooking mixed with the equally unpleasant smell of horse manure and drying animal skins that were stretched out on frames. There were all sorts of men and women busily going to and fro, attending to whatever their business was, some young, some old, almost all thin and smaller than the population to which the boys were accustomed. There were flags and banners hanging from the walls, and down to the left was a team of beautiful and very large horses, covered with their fine and beautiful armor and cloth coverings, and a group of knights dressed in armor, helmets off, talking and adjusting straps on the horses and laughing among themselves. The boys heard the clank, clank, clank of a hammer on an anvil as they walked by the fire of what was obviously the blacksmith's shop and heard the sizzle of hot metal being dunked into water for tempering. Within another stall-like enclosure, the boys caught sight of a knight being measured by what they thought must be a metalworking tailor, repairing armor for the knight, who stood looking bored as the tailor, sheet metal worker, held up a piece of metal and made a mark, showing where one piece of armor should stop and where another be began. I always wondered how they made these suits of armor, Fergus said. The reply he received was a sharp prod in the back from one of his captors. These people all around them were busy doing their work, but they took time to stare as the boys walked by. They had not seen such specimens before. It was obvious the boys were young, but so fair? They looked so healthy and even fat by the standards of that skinny time. They wondered what it was uh, that the two of them wore on their faces, over their eyes. And these clothes, they had never seen such clothes. The strangers' their shirts were thin and appeared smooth, not at all like the thick handmade tunics they wore. And the footwear, who had ever seen anything other than ill-fitting, crudely tanned leather, perhaps with wooden soles for protection of the feet? 
What were those brightly colored contours shoes they had? Even if the boys had stopped to explain that they were running shoes, well, who had ever heard of running shoes? Yes, the people stopped and stared. Women smiled and made jokes to the young girls who blushed. Men secretly wished they had been as handsome in their youth and wished to see the maidens that might be the counterparts of these young lads. <clears throat> the boys came upon the oven from which was rising the incredible aroma of baking bread. The brown and steamy loaves were just being pulled from over the hot coals and reminded the boys that they had not eaten in far too long. Damon yelled to the baker, Hey, you got an extra one of those? The baker ignore, ignored the yell, but an old man, one who had been at the drawbridge, went to the oven as they walked in, grabbed a hot loaf of bread and tossed it to Damon. Damon, even with his hands tied in front, caught the bread, then bobbled it because it was so hot, but managed to keep hold and tear off a piece before handing it to Mikkel, who did the same and gave the remainder, remainder to Fergus. All the boys were hungry, and the bread was a real treat. Thanks, Damon yelled in a muffled voice to the old man after he took a bite. Fergus appreciated the fact that at least one person had shown some kindness. Oh, if things were only different! If their hands were not tied, if they were not being prodded with sticks by the hunters, if they hadn't just walked for an hour and a half through the woods, if they had had a drink of water, if they hadn't been told they were going to be executed, if they knew where the girls were, if they knew where they were, if, in essence, almost everything were different, the boys would have been excited to see what they were seeing, excited to experience what they were experiencing. Yes, under other circumstances, the castle would have looked, well, not like Cinderella's, but definitely inviting for kids. Castles, even if inhabited by giants or trolls or dragons, rub the inner magic lamp concealed in every kid's head, waking the genie that lies sleeping within, with invitations to adventures as plenteous as stars in the night sky, as multitudinous as the sparks that fly from a grinding wheel and steel. In the mind's eye, there were protected sunny parapets for walking, spiral steps to mock danger, a moat to fish in, walls to scamper along, and great halls with enormous fireplaces for warming on cold winter mornings. Even in their dire circumstances, their imaginations could not be extinguished, such thoughts flickered briefly inside the mind's eye for each of the boys. Also residing in the imagination were knights, ladies, pages, servants, a jester, and a host of colorful troubadours singing of great deeds of arms and acts of bravery that would bring wondrous swoons from ladies and grudging admiration from would-be heroes. They could imagine furtive and flirtive glances from wine-warmed eyes and bosoms to burly hirsute warriors with hands occupied with a turkey leg or a succulent pig's foot. Ah, the mind of youth could envision large cur-like dogs, dewy-eyed hounds slinking between night's feet in search of morsels and bones and gristle treats, a warm toasty kitchen filled with coarse laughter <clears throat> and washed with wafts of baking bread and roasting pig a shimmering tower with beautiful maidens and cages with kaleidoscopic birds singing to the heavens above with a thousand imagination destinations to delight the soul of kids of any age. These were enough to ignite the flames of curiosity, the essence of childhood, the precursor of adult accomplishment that were lying smoldered yet smothering under books, homework assignments, math worksheets, dirty socks and the incessant monotony of dry breakfast toast, mandatory broccoli, and the lockstep routine and regimentation of everyday life. Yes, in another circumstance, in another time, this castle would have looked inviting. But not in this one. No, it was not the outward appearance, but the fact that these boys were headed for the dungeon and the gallows that caused their dreams and expectations to pop like bubbles and to hiss into extinction. 
like the heat of the blacksmith's steel and water. The joy and excitement of imagination receded like the flow of a tidal marsh, leaving only mud and scraggly tufts of reality in their place. Imagination took a darker turn toward the hanging idea and put a damper on their spirits. The kids thought of other options. Mikkel thought about being tied up and thrown, in, thrown into the moat. Damon thought about starving to death in the dungeon. Fergus thought about beheading. None of these seemed like a good way to go. <clears throat> the group came to a large, heavy door. One of the foresters knocked, and a very ugly, scarred face appeared in an eye-level opening. The boys heard words being spoken. The door opened, revealing only deep, contrasting darkness. The foresters pushed them inside. The boys went in, then down the stairs that dripped with water, then to a lower floor. The large, grim guard from the inside took some big, heavy keys and opened a dungeon door. Here, he commanded with a gruff voice. The boys walked in. It was dark and smelled beyond horrible. I don't believe I like this room, Fergus said to the guard. Maybe look at another. The guard didn't seem to have a sense of humor. All the boys heard was the heavy thud of the door closing behind them and the loud turning of the key, the slow drip, drip drip of water on stone, and then there was just the darkness. So now we know the details of their capture. The foresters returned that evening and reported to the king that the white stag was in the area. They were convinced that they would have gotten it, except that they were deceived by a group of poachers, mere lads, but surely poachers. Not only poachers, but these lads possess some kind of evil magic, for they cast a spell on their dogs so that they chase false trails. Yes, these poachers interfered with the forester's tracking of the white stag. Not to worry about the poachers, however. They were in the dungeon awaiting trial for hunting in the king's forest and for giving false information to representatives of the king. Anon, they would hang on the gallows as a warning to others. The king's woods belonged to the king, not to varlets, no matter how strange they might appear.